Yeah, cool. Um, my name is Joshua Shigala. I uh, I've been uh, working in Bitcoin and cryptos since late 2010, and um, and uh, you know one of, one of the OGs that fell down the Mount Gox uh, hole, just like uh, people are uh, discovering now with FTX. Uh, this was the first Bitcoin exchange in the world and the first one to die, massive death, and um, and yeah, it actually. Um, got me to uh, sit together with my brother and, and develop the glass books protocol which was a, a transparency protocol for exchanges um, exchanges still haven't uh, taken us up on this protocol except uh, we we did and uh, so we launched an exchange called Voltoro back in 2015 and um, and uh, this was the first Bitcoin physical gold exchange. Uh, it's uh, been, you know, more of a, a, a way to prove uh, technologies like the transparency uh, protocol, uh, the Glassbooks protocol. But also uh, we were the first exchange to develop the Lightning Network uh, to implement it and have it working. And... Um, and We lost uh, massage out the scaling debate uh, for Bitcoin uh, when that was happening because it was a stalemate and it was horrible. And uh, then we, you know, um, I, I can, definitely can't take uh, all the credit or anywhere near all the credit. Obviously, it was a big community thing. Um, but, you know, uh, we managed to, the big blockers got their thing, the small blockers got their thing, and we, we managed to move forward. So that, that was good. And uh, and yeah, in 2019, I, I was uh, gave a talk at the LaBitConf and uh, talked about how um, stablecoin uh, algorithmic, pure algorithmic stablecoins, one of them is going to get very big, um, something like Luna and probably crash and die, just like the rest of the algorithmic stablecoins that we've seen come and go. And um, sure enough, uh, that that's what happened. But uh, a year before that, we started working on the ultimate stablecoin solution, which is really uh, over collateralized, uh, where people lock up assets. So there's more uh, value locked up in the system than there is uh, stable coins floating around so uh, and and people still hold the private keys to those they don't give those up so this was a really important step uh, forward and uh, we've you know been working on that for about a year now and uh, we're we're doing the soft launch on the 28th so um, join us and uh, have a look at the uh, uh, have a look at the website the standard.io and uh, and uh, yeah give us any feedback if you've got some I'll uh, hand it over to Nicholas. <laughs> Hi, my name is Nicholas. I'm the founder and general partner of Infinita, the first VC fund that's based in Prospera and focusing on startup cities. I'm originally from Germany. I spent most of my 20s in Berlin, and I'm looking forward to tell you the story how I ended up in Honduras on the other side of the world, which is where Prospera is based. Right, so charter cities are basically cities that have their own charter, so they can make their own rules. And um, it is a trend that's trying to emulate the successes of Dubai, to some degree Singapore, to some degree Hong Kong, to some degree Shenzhen, China, or more generally sort of the Chinese economic growth model. All right, so the idea kind of is, it's too hard to reform um, politics and the rules and institutions on a big national level. So you start small, you give smaller jurisdictions autonomy to create their own rules and regulations. And places like Hong Kong or Dubai, they created very business friendly rules and regulations and that attracted a lot of economic growth and prosperity. I think Dubai was several hundred xing its per capita GDP. And charter cities are basically trying to make that model more scalable to have a much larger number of startups all over the world that try to um, innovate when it comes to governance, try to create better rules and regulations that make people thrive instead of holding them back. Sure, so um, <clears throat> just to give a um, to make the picture a bit more vivid, there's already a couple of dozens of charter cities around the world. It depends really on the definition. You could say there are several thousand economic zones, in the uh, special economic zones in the world and almost every continent. There's hundreds. 
And charter cities just go a step further in my definition, mm -hmm. right? So they're really trying to make their own rules and regulations so, and have this degree of autonomy. Prosper, in my opinion, is the best example of this. This is the one that's most advanced. It's an actual place with several hundreds of people living there physical, physically, several thousand e-residents, has their own full legal sec, has an e-governance platform, mm -hmm. and has land, right? And so that's just to situate where blockchain solutions can come in. Mm. And so uh, it plays a role at the um, level mm. of the governance services, right? So what if you could have governance services, you know, transactions, public services, and um, that private citizens make, that the government is making, you know, contract enforcement, um, several security layers, mm. um, its own cryptocurrency. And have it all on the blockchain as part of the tech stack of you know a um, a governance service provider so that's kind of the solution space prospera is already um implementing some of these right it's not like a full on chain governance service solution but i think that is just a very promising place to try out some of these solutions on chain a role at the um, level mm. of the governance services, right? So what if you could have governance services, you know, transactions, public services, and um, that private citizens make, that the government is making, you know, contract enforcement, um, several security layers, mm. um, its own cryptocurrency, and have it all on the blockchain as part of the tech stack of, you know, a, um, a governance service provider. So that's kind of the solution space. Prosper is already um, implementing some of these, right? It's not like a full on-chain governance service solution, but I think that is just a very promising place to try out some of these solutions on-chain. For me, what the big rabbit hole when finding the the Satoshi white paper was like, wow, we have startup money we have private rare numbers that uh that is permissionless wow uh, mind blown startup cities are kind of this other panacea for this cypherpunk dream of of having economic theory being tried out in in micro economies so on in the blockchain space you can try out economic theory without gulags right you can you can just see hey uh let's see if it happens so for instance we had frycoin um startup years ago which was a a demurrage coin uh that basically lost value over time to stop people hodling to see if see if people would move that money and we'd have more velocity in the money rather than bitcoin didn't work flatlined, but hey, no one, you know, it was voluntary. No one died. No one got forced by a gun to use it. And um, and and these sorts of things are great. But imagine now if we could try startup law plus startup economic theory, um, where we can see, you know, hey, this is voluntary. Come and join the community, and uh, and we we take it really seriously to have competing governance structures. For me so this is a, a big step forward in in anarchic philosophy um that 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 stems from the the bitcoin uh philosophy but also from the a lot of the writings of austrian economists uh, as well as um well uh, you know uh, as well as just general cypherpunk um <laughs> sort of ethos and and really yeah. when uh when i got in in touch with uh with nicholas and you know, one of our, our um, uh, uh, advisors is Patrick Friedman um, uh, of the the Friedman family. You know, Milton Friedman and, and David D. Friedman, and and also his work and his life work has been in these startup cities, especially seasteading. So, um, uh, when when that that all sort of fit in place very very well for me philosophically, but also uh, with the connections that I have in the space. So. I'm I'm just so impressed what uh, what you guys have built already in Prospera. It's it's really really exciting, and I'm I'm just looking forward to seeing what what comes next. Yeah, mm -hmm. if I may add on top of that, um, you're already 
Uh, so imagine government or governance was an industry, right? Sort of a service provider. You know, you get your ID, your passport issued. Some of these governments provide public transport, not all of them. Some of them are, you know, more pleasant, some less. Some involve themselves in some areas of the economy, some less. <laughs> but just think of it as a service, as a bundle, right? It would be between 40 and 50% of world GDP. Right, it's the biggest industry in the world by far, by a large order of magnitude. And when you apply what Josh mentioned, economic analysis to it, most governments, almost all governments, are some sort of local monopoly. Right, the switching costs are very high, so you have to leave your family and friends behind. Some have explicit exit taxes, like Denmark, where you have to pay sixty percent of your net worth to exit the country. So you know you have just set up in this custodial relationship with many governments around the world, which is simply because they're monopolies, right? They can do it, even though the product gets worse over time and more expensive. Like you know, you're paying 40, 50 percent taxes in Berlin, I suppose. There's nothing you can do about it until now, until uh, and by making it cheaper to switch, we're creating this competition for better governance services and essentially disrupting the largest industry in the world which is also the base layer of society, right? You need a functioning society to build other things on top, to build technology, to build businesses. And by improving the space layer, I think we're onto, you know, a further hundred Xing human flourishing and capabilities. So I see a good point for DAOs, depending on the purpose, right? So I'm a great fan of DAOs like Vida DAO or Lab DAO and Sci DAO and DAOs like that, because they're addressing a very specific problem, which is basic research funding, right? So it's hard to get research uh, funding for some of these areas. It's all nationalized, large grants and foundations and institutions. And there's areas like longevity that Vita DAO cares a lot about that is just not receiving funding. Through DAOs, they can basically funnel money from the crypto industry and large donors like Vitalik Buterin into basic research. And basically DAOs are the way to, you know, um, give out grants to organizations that can do research on longevity and biotech. So I think that's a very specific use case that DAOs are excellent for, mm -hmm. right? At the same time, a lot of DAOs are a lot about, um, basically different voting systems. And I think that's not necessarily where the key innovation will be when it comes to different voting systems, right? So I think a lot of it has been tried out over the last couple of hundreds of years. And um, there's a reason that, um, you know, I, I think we can solve the problems that we see in societies through better voting systems. I, I would absolutely agree with uh, with Nicolas uh, that uh, you, you, voting, you know, voting has, Voting is a hard one because you really, it, it makes a lot of sense, right? You are, okay, everyone here, everyone's part of this. Uh, everyone put your hand up if you want this. Okay, wow, that's great. But actually, it's funny. It's, it goes diametrically with, with society where we're like, oh, we've got to, you know, look after the, un, the, the underrepresented. And we, we've got to, you know, oh, the, the minority groups are really important. We've got to, you know, we all think that too, that's important. But democracy doesn't allow for minority groups and stuff because hey especially for the ultimate minority which is the individual the individual is the ultimate minority there's no more minority than that <laughs> that's as far as it goes and um and so by looking at different mechanisms um we might be able to just allow ourselves to try stuff so when people say well what other option is there uh, there's just you know they always just say well democracy or you know monarchy or fascism that's you know that's sort of or, or you know just a, a a full um sort of top-down approach and it's like no well there can be other ways to go you know and we we could for instance try out um uh, prediction markets uh rather than democracy for instance right this is a really interesting idea um because we as humans are pretty bad at determining the future so we get bamboozled with the cult of personality you know we're like oh that person's really funny or i've seen them on tv a lot so i'm going to vote for them because i kind of resonate with the jokes that he said or 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 some of the policies or whatever 
and they've made great promises in the you know so we vote for them and then it all just turns sour and corruption and human uh, weaknesses and all the rest all the stuff we know about democracy also comes in so you know one one solution might be like hey um instead of voting for someone like you've got either uh, a or b you say hey uh will a create uh, a, a, a stronger happiness index in three years time or five years time where uh, and then people bet on that either yes or no and and then uh wherever the odds are is almost like who determines who gets in so the odds step in and you decide okay that person's now in charge because the the betting decided and betting's interesting but let me just finish that in, in five years time, they can then do a survey and say, hey, what's the happiness index? The happiness index, yep, oh, it, it didn't match. So everyone that voted against that by betting against that person actually gets paid out a, a whole bunch of money. And the interesting thing is with money is that you tend to put your dogmas aside. Like if you were to bet on a sports team, maybe you have always always gone for the blues and uh and and so is your dad and so is your granddad and your grandma and the whole family's just concept of for generations being for the blues but you know in this next big important game that the goalie has screwed his leg up uh the mid has like got a screw back the other one's got covid whatever <laughs> you know you know that you're gonna lose now if you put money on that game i could guarantee you no matter how big a fan are if you had to put money on and you knew the bad side of your team you you probably go on the reds so um, so, so it, by betting, it puts your sort of, uh, it, it allow you know, betting is a bad word. It's got a lot of connotations, but by placing wager on, on, uh, and using money, you tend to put away dogmas. Now that's just one solution. Obviously there's also other solutions like just a corporate, a, a corporation that runs a city that might also be a solution. Hey, you know, I get to choose whether I go and use Nike shoes or Puma shoes. Um, I like Nike better because they maybe have fixed a lot of their problems with slavery <laughs> uh, or whatever. Um, so I might choose that. So it, it runs along the, the same vein of, of the most important thing here is voluntarism, allowing switching to be very, very cheap. Because if you allow switching, you allow people to vote with their feet and go, you know what, this isn't for me it's gone a bit too in the wrong direction. I mean, Josh and I probably agree there, right? So I think um, we need more choices, what you can opt into instead of better voting systems, right? I think there is some leeway to improve voting systems. I'm not in per se against voting, right? It's just a question of what do you vote on, right? Almost anyone accepts that you have some discretion over your choices, what happens with your body. Right, it requires consent um, from others to, you know, um, ask you to do certain things. Right, nobody is regulating who you can um, date or marry. I mean, there are some restrictions around the world um, that aren't good. Right, especially when it comes to you know um, homosexual homosexuality or different sexual preferences. And we, we probably agree that that's not good. That's not right. So a human individual has discretion over their choices. All right. So the question really is what are you willing where are you willing to give others discretion right if your home ownership association is deciding for you you know what um you know have to put the pool in the backyard or what noise level is right for the community or or things like that you know um you're voting with your feet by opting in and having an easy way to opt out of someone else making choices for you you're opting for bundles like like what you do in the marketplace all the time Well, I can talk a bit more about Prosper itself and why I'm excited about it, why I decided to move here. Another thing that could be interesting is, you know, what other cities are out there and what are the opportunities for people in this community to engage with it? What are the solutions that are needed? What are places around the world where people can go? You know, anything you're interested in. went to prosper for the first time in April and I was having conversations like that before right we share some of the same ideas and same philosophy but you know much of that has been in the in theory for a very long time right so people like people have been economists like Friedrich Hayek have been talking about um, you know the centralization of money for decades 
but there's just nothing you can do about it, right? All you can do with that argument is feed a few economists and try to write books about it. Now with the blockchain, the world has been opening up to new opportunities, right? And has been really creating this large movement, sort of bringing talent to develop alternative solutions, not only in the financial world, but also in the legal world. And that's what really excites me. But um, I wasn't even a, a tenth as much excited of what I am now before I actually was visiting Prospera, right? Because and I think it's a similar effect to discovering or learning how the blockchain works and that we can actually build a different decentralized financial system. So it was for me to really see it and learn um, how Prospera works on the ground, right? So um, what many people think Honduras, oh, that sounds like crime and corruption. And that is largely true for the mainland. Rotanitz itself is a beautiful Caribbean island with existing infrastructure, about 70,000 people living on it, abundantly friendly and open-minded people living on the island. Many of them or most of them speak English. It used to be a British colony. And Prospera owns a small fraction of the land there and is a thriving community. There's loads of construction going on. There's the so-called better building, which is a super nice co-working space. Um, Prospera also bought the neighboring luxury golf resort, which is where I'm based right now. Um, so that's a bit more from the fancy side. The rest of Prospera is a bit more jungly and things are being built. And there's a community of several hundreds of people he here. Most of them are Honduran, right? Sort of both service workers from neighboring villages and local communities that are, you know, the security guards, the maids, the cooks. Some of them are asking me, hey, can you also teach me how to build a website? And oh, I want to create this like school where children can come to instead of commuting for one and a half hours a day. So, you know, they want to get educated, they want to start businesses, and it's just having this great local impact there. And at the same time, I think Prospera has uniquely um, created the best possible that I can think of legal guardrails for the kinds of um, disruption that is happening in the blockchain world to enter the real world, right? So um, they have a regulatory model called the regulatory choice model, right? So instead of them deciding businesses are regulated in ways X, Y, Z, they say you can choose the regulation that you're under as a business. And there are several ways to do that, mostly three different ones. One is you just accept regulations from another country that's in a list of OECD best practices countries. So if you like the insurance regulation from Bermuda the best or the pharmaceutical regulations from Japan the best or for medical clinics from Norway the best, you can do it there and you put your business under the, that regulation. The second option is to write your own regulation. Right, so we have a bank here, Sashat Bank, and they wrote their own regulation by piecing together the best parts from different kinds of regulations in the world. And it's strongly based on the ideas of Mervyn King, the former governor of the Bank of England, who developed an alternative model to the lender of last resort model that's underlying the central banking system. And, you know, make a more decentralized banking system that doesn't cause these systemic risks. Right, and the third option is just to be under no regulation but accept very harsh common law legal liability, right? So if you do something wrong, you know, the corporate veil doesn't protect you, right? So this way you have an incentive to better, you know, not do things that are too risky, right? And um, that is coupled with a binding agreement that you accept arbitration, right? There's both a Prosper arbitration center and you can also do international arbitration. You don't have to be under the arbitration of Prosper. Right. And the second one is liability insurance. Right. So you have need to have liability insurance for just to be a citizen there for any kinds of action. And when you're a business, then it basically depends on the tier you're in. Some industries are considered regulated where you need higher premiums for liability insurance. And but from then on, you can really negotiate with your insurance how risky they think your activities are as a business. So I think these are the best possible legal guardrails I can think of to unleash really a new wave of innovation and progress that's been held back in many areas, right? I'm specifically thinking of, you know, lots in the blockchain finance space, like anything that's not possible because of the SEC, 
Second, disrupting the world of atoms, like thinking nuclear energy, autonomous drone delivery, flying cars and robotics. And the third one, health and biotech. And I'd be happy to talk more about any of these areas, but that's really what fascinates me so much about Prospera and what we can create more of with startup cities and special jurisdictions. And I think it's really the best opportunity for any entrepreneur around the world, um, especially when they're in blockchain and finance, but also in some other areas that are bottlenecked because of bad regulations. Um, the time is now. There's really no time to lose. <laughs> Check out Prosper, check out a couple of different jurisdictions. You know, it's not mm -hmm. only there's also countries like, you know, Malta or Portugal or Puerto Rico. That's especially interesting for tax credits and biotech. So, um, you know, um, vote with your feet. Go where you can best thrive. I really imagine um, a world where we can try to find um an equilibrium between safety uh, and freedom and uh, because this is kind of what everyone is always after but, but also by being able to test out certain um certain aspects of safety so uh, let I, I i am really looking forward to saying hey there's a there's a city who's trying out private uh policing and private courts let's say um because these these are one points where people generally get really like ooh, uh, icky private courts oh that sounds really sketchy, and you're like okay well what happens if you have private police if you have a competing police forces, and uh, and one one company I don't know starts roughing up people all the time then they're not going to get customers for very much longer because they've just been roughing up everybody and I'm never going to hire you employ you. And, uh, and, and so imagine if you, um, you, I think this would work very closely with insurance, because if you got robbed, um, you, you would then uh, go to your local police force and say, look, I, I want this investigated. Um, and they would then say, hey, I think it was this person over here. Uh, they were at the same place at the same time. And, uh, you know, so, so they would contact then his insurance company uh, or police, uh, private police force and say, hey, hand him over. And they're like, no, show us your evidence. And they would deal with all of that. Now, if a judge um, was, was uh, seen to be corrupt, for instance, in the current system, no, there's no punishment. There's nothing really, you know, because there's no competition there. Uh, whereas in a competing legal system, you could have um, where judges would be very, very scared of being exposed for being corrupt because no one would hire them in the future. And... Um, and this is really, really important. And this is sort of how I, how I would like to see uh, stuff play out in the future, where we can try out different mechanisms for law, uh, private law, private courts, private policing, um, and uh, because the word private has been very, very uh, well, it's been destroyed in terms of what a lot of people think that means. That when they say private, that a lot of people are very scared of that, but. It's funny because if you say you have a private car, they're like, yeah, that's that's great, you know, or, or a private bike or a private house. But when it comes to certain things like this, and um, I, I think it's really important that you have competition in as many places as possible. Competition keeps the bastards honest. And that's, yeah. you know, it's a good old Aussie saying, but uh, it, it's a really true one because you need uh, you need that competing space to be able to define what a good actor looks like. If you, if you don't have good, you don't have bad, you know, you need yin yang, you need that competition, you need both sides, even a duopoly is better than a monopoly, uh, in a lot of ways. To uh, add, so like, um, the two things you mentioned, like police, private security, and private law already exists, right? <laughs> I mean, in the United States, at least more than half of the police force is private security guards. I don't know to what degree that's true in Germany or in Europe, but you see private security guards and people it's everywhere, right? And if anything, your experience with them is probably much more pleasant than with government police, right? Government police where you see lots of brutality and, you know, qualified immunity and things like that. Yep. So, you know, that's already so obvious that private security works better. And also to add on that, um, I can go into any rabbit hole, really. You know, it, it's just so impossible to monopolize private police. 
right? There's no economies of scale, right? So private security firms are small service provider that are purely based on human labor. So what gives you an advantage is really knowing the local context, right? So there is no industry that would be more and is already more decentralized, right? Uh, same when it comes to law, right? I mean, English common law is a decentralized way of making law, right? We're used to statutory law, which comes from the Napoleonic area. Um, but before there was plenty of private provision of law. We also see it all around us everywhere, right? So eBay and, you know, some of these platforms have probably private adjudication, right, <laughs> of, some of, of some of these disputes. The United States, I don't know Europe, but there's a large system of private um, arbitration in commercial disputes, right? And even government is outsourcing some of their court disputes to the private system because their own system is too expensive and inefficient, right? So with any of these things, the experience is, is already there. It's not just theoretical, right? I think a lot of the challenges that that uh, that are met by by people uh, pioneers like Nicholas um, is that people nowadays are very short minded. If you talk to a forester um, or someone that owns forestry, it's quite amazing. Um, you, you start to see that they think in a different way. Um, I was talking to a forester only like I don't know eight months ago. And he was showing me around the forest. He was saying, oh, this part here we've cleared for my, uh, for my future great-great-grandchildren. Uh, the scales are totally different in his head. Um, th there's these tiny little trees, and, and they're already talking about the, the great-great-grandchildren uh, that, he, that he, there's nowhere near to be seen yet. They're not even a twinkle in their eye yet. Um, and and that's, that's kind of interesting. And I think Chartered Cities really... It's about um, it, you know things things do take time uh, to to scale up, but they need to scale up from the bottom up. I feel you cannot come into a large city and say right now we've got a a new um, you know a total new governance structure, total new police structure because uh, you would have pandemic and and then people go look it's anarchy how terrible um, because you really need to go to a post enlightened style anarchy because that's what free markets are uh, and they're self-organizing and structuring and there's a fundamental need and there's a lot of talk in philosophical circles um especially free market circles about like having secular ethics having um having having um systems in play that we can all agree to no matter what religion you are uh it, and that is basically hey i don't want to be killed and I don't want to have my stuff stolen. Like, don't hit and don't steal. Pretty much sort of playground po politics, you know. <laughs> the, the, the first thing you teach kids, don't hit and don't steal. And, and, and if we can go from that and use that as first principles and, and understand that it's a long road to building out a city, I think, I think that's a really uh, a, a good step forward to set the mindset that, uh, of people um, uh, moving forward in these, uh, in these sort of chartered cities. Yeah, I conclude with three points. One is the whole point of charter cities is it's not just one particular ideology that you need to buy into to like it. If you want something where you have more provision of public goods by a government, there's a way to do that, right? The whole point is experimentation to see what works best. Deal up a bit more on the private market side or on another side. The point is that you can voluntarily opt in and opt out, right? And almost no one that I talk to, whatever their political background is, Kind of disagrees with that more experimentation is good like we're seeing the problems everywhere in our political system and all we want to do with charter cities is get more innovation and see what works on a small scale with people that are willing to take the risk right so I encourage everyone even if you're not don't think the free market version of it is the best solution there is um you know there's something else for you out there the second one is just to a book recommendation just to get a sense of what's at stake there's a book called Where Is My Flying Car by an author named Jay Stores Hall. I had him on my podcast. You can check out Spotify, the Stranded Technologies podcast. And what he really drives home is we could live in a world already that's three times as wealthy, and it has flying cars that bring us from place to place. The technological and engineering challenges of these things are already solved. 
right? And they're solved in many areas across the spectrum, including nanotechnology, biotechnology, aviation, and all sorts of things. We've seen in the world of atoms a massive stagnation, largely driven by declining or stagnating use of energy, right? So that means we're missing out on so much progress and innovation. Right. So we want to be to save the planet, you know, preserve a good climate. We want to go to other planets. We want to um, enable people to live a longer and healthier and more flourishing life. Like the magnitude of what's at stake here is tremendous. Just what I mentioned before, the base, if we can change the base layer of society, we can maybe 10, maybe even 100 X um, the human flourishing. Right. So, and the third one is um, don't just listen to me. If I would be you listening right now, um, like in Berlin three years ago, I would have the same reaction. That just sounds utopian and fantastic. And you're probably a little bit skeptical. But I promise you, what will happen if you check out Prosper yourself is, is a similar experience to reading the Bitcoin wh uh, white paper for the first time. All of a sudden, you see the possible solution space. All of a sudden, you start thinking, wow, I can now question all these things that I took for granted before, right? And for this purpose, I'm creating um, continuously touch points to visit Prospera, right? So one week from now, I'm organizing a conference called the Prospera FinTech and DeFi Summit. So you can go on my website, infinitafund.com. To, to come over here, right? From Berlin, the flights might be a bit challenging. Don't worry. You can fly to San Pedro Sula. Um, and from there, there are small local airlines. The flights search engines don't always find. Feel free to message me if I can help you make travel arrangements. And, you know, see for yourself. Let's try out these ideas in the real world in practice. The things I'd like to add yeah. just while we're waiting for a question is... On the on the topic of like, you know, the, the the typical question is always, yeah, but what about the roads, right? Um, this is the this is the question when it comes to you know, uh, and Kapistan sort of questions, and and really, could you imagine if uh, if we if the government took all this money through taxation, and instead of uh, and and just basically gave everybody free horse and cart. Uh, while Henry Ford was trying to make his uh, car. And everyone would say, like, I've got a free horse and car. I can get everywhere. I'll get free food, free veterinarianism, free free horseshoes. Um, and uh, and I, I don't need this weird, stinky machine that runs on oil and spews out stuff and is dangerous and only, only goes about this a little bit faster than a horse. Um, I, I don't really need it. it. It looks horrible and it's actually slower than a horse because uh, you, you know when I get a, my, my daisy here into a gallop, yeah, what would happen? Well, we would never have had cars because we would have subsidized an older technology. So roads being free all the time, and probably mostly if it's anywhere near you, pretty bad roads too, potholes everywhere, but you know, they're free. Um, who knows what would have happened uh, by now if we would have had a free market with roads, if, if, if you build a house and you have to build part of, part of building a house is building a road from another road to your house so you can get to it and others or when you have a shopping center maybe they they do a do a road uh to the shopping center and then attach it to another part of the road maybe they have like tolls uh, that are automatic now that we've got these phones you can automatically go beep bing with gps like we we don't know how we can do it and like maybe people go wow this is really expensive and inefficient i'm going to invent a flying car um and bring it on board like we we don't know what we would have had if we hadn't subsidized roads right it sounds weird and silly but it's just an interesting thought experiment to think about yeah i mean it's all a matter of trying it out right i found it um uh, funny like economists around like the 1950s they were all in agreement like even the free market economists um you need government to build lighthouses right <laughs> because it's kind of this public good like you can't exclude certain ships from benefiting from that light and not crashing at the rocks. <laughs> and then someone came up and, well, private lighthouses exist. And it's yeah. just, and, you, and you feel, and you hear the same thing over and over with all sorts of things that we thought only the government can provide like roads. Even Milton Friedman thought the government, only the government can provide roads. We see plenty yeah. of private roads. <laughs> yeah. I, I, the I, we see tall roads and we see congestion pricing, you know. 
Yeah, I mean, a really good example is like the, the postal service. It, it would have been unthinkable to have private postal service. Uh, it would have been way too expensive, way too slow. It would have been corrupted, people stealing stuff. Um, uh, you know, it, why would you know you need a government to do that? Now we have UPS, DHL, all these ones that are that are so amazing at logistics that they're getting stuff to you the next day um, and even sometimes on a, a, you know on the same day delivery like it, it's it's phenomenal what we have right now logistically wise in the private sector and 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 this would have also seemed absolutely impossible um years ago so yeah it's a, it's a really good point yeah i mean one thing that i might mention as a point of skepticism towards making everything based on private solutions i could just imagine it i'm not saying that that's my opinion but um, it's kind of the uh, the cold start problem, right? So Prosper, for example, doesn't yet have private insurance, right? So they are the insurer of last resort of liability insurance. I mean, they want private solutions. They want to bring insurance companies there. But, you know, and I think Singapore and South Korea and others have started from a very small basis towards becoming capitalist economies had a similar problem, like, since some of these things, there is just a fundamental lack of solutions and government could, in theory, sometimes they might even do successfully uh, fast track that or kind of, you know, kickstart a certain industry or do some help, right? Yeah. I'm not sure I entirely believe that argument, but I can see the trade-off that Prospera is facing in that example of insurance industry. And I can imagine that Singapore, South Korea and others face similar situations. So the question is how you get there, because... If then the government provides that solution that already is creating perverse incentives, right? Because how do you get rid of a public agency after it's tasked with, with something like that? Yeah, yeah, especially. So this uh... goes all goes to say that plenty of innovation is needed, right? And I'm not precluding public solutions and governments being smart about doing things, right? I mean, after all, um, the Chinese government was smart to allow Shenzhen and these special economic zones. The Honduran government was extremely forward thinking with allowing these special autonomous zones and they crafted the most innovative legislation in the world. So I think we need to work with governments that are open to helping yeah. us bring in this broad innovation to market. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. It's not something you can can just do start off privately we we are so in conditioned as humans how we've grown up as society um with these institutions we, you can't just rid them and start again um you, you really can't you need to work with them but with the goal to minimize them if not eradicate them eventually or not even that the goal is really switching cost you said it right there at the start if you can have really almost no switching cost then that is what happens is that hey, you might have a startup city that's a full-on tyranny because people there love being under that tyranny. <laughs> I don't know. There's, there's weird people out there, um, but it's voluntary to be there um, because, and, you know, the trains run on time there. I don't know. <laughs> so so um, it's uh, it's all up to people uh, where they live and having that switching cost is really, really important. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like, I think the biggest danger or risk or something that, we know from history doesn't work is radical change right is yep. violent revolution things like yep. that right so anywhere you are in the world you need to build on existing institutions existing cultures and you know improve through evolution and through gradual improvement rather than radical overhaul And if anyone wants to stay in touch with what we're building, um, go to the standard.io. Uh, we're really aiming, been building for a year now. We're going to launch on the 28th. It's um, it's a, a really an over collateralized stablecoin protocol where people lock up assets and um, and issue themselves uh, debt. And so we don't need banks uh, in, anymore. We can issue ourselves debt uh, at zero percent interest. So it's a lot of amazing stuff being built in DeFi. Uh, we've got a great team and um, yeah, if you've got any questions, um, hit me up.